And this quote says, fundamentalism is not what we believe. That's what I grew up with. But he's saying it's no longer what we believe. It's how we hold our beliefs. So that's how it's perceived now. That's how it's used now. And then he goes through a list. Hey guys, Jill here, back to the word. Today with a video that's been a while in the making. I've been excited about this topic, been doing some research and putting it together for you. Today's video is what is fundamentalism or who is a fundamentalist and how has the use of those terms changed over the last 100 years, really from the 1920s until now. I'm filming this in the spring of 2024. And we're going to talk about this shift and change from it used to mean held beliefs to now how one holds their belief. So brief, why this video? I really became curious about these topics because I grew up with fundamentalism being a good thing. I was part of an independent Bible church preaching the Bible as it is for people as they are. I've talked more on my channel about this and my theological journey video, which you can find and listen to and watch. Um, I also grew up going to uh, IFCA youth conventions and doing Bible quizzing, which stood for the Independent Fundamental Churches of America. And so I grew up with it being a good thing, but I have noticed a change in the last couple years and just really wanted to put together some of the clips, some of the things that I've seen, put this out there and ask for really your help in tracing some of these changes and would love your input. And so this video is going to trace the change from the 1920s to what fundamentalist and fundamentalism meant back then to really what it has meant and means today and I would love your help in the comments as I discuss these things. I am not exhaustive here. I have not read a whole bunch of books on this. I've really just been picking up on clips, articles, and things, putting them together in a video, sharing them with all of you, and I would love your help to learn more about these and your personal experience along the way as well. I also plan to do a longer historical video on the 1920s era, the modernist versus the fundamentalist controversy. Um, I plan to do that after I read Machen's book, Christianity and Liberalism. I'm hoping to do a read and reflect on this later this year, and I'll probably do a deeper dive into that actual historic era, but we're gonna hit some of the high points in this video what it meant back there to be a fundamentalist or fu hold to fundamentalism, and then how that has shifted and changed today. So the contents of this video are timestamped below, but here's the general overview. We're going to go over what changed, some of the first clips I saw that tipped me off that some of this had changed, and I wanted to do a video on this. We're gonna define some terms and talk through the different terms and what I mean by them in this video. Then we're gonna talk about historically held beliefs, what this meant back 100 years ago, 1920s era, what it meant to be a fundamentalist, fundamentalist or hold to fundamentalism. Then we're gonna talk about the shift and some examples and then some current things and how it has shifted to how one holds their beliefs. Then I'm gonna go through some applications and some summary points and then resources used for this video. I'm gonna put a blog post on my blog. I'll link it in the description with a brief outline that I'm gonna use for this video with notes and then anything I mention, I'll cite it and link it in that blog post as well. And then I would love your feedback and I'm gonna ask you some feed for some feedback at the end of this video. So with that, this is Back to the Word. My channel exists to equip and encourage you to read the Bible good books, and have conversations that truly matter. This definitely falls in that final category because I think it's important as we use these terms, talk about things that we know not only how they're being used today, but historically how that term has been used in the past. So what changed? This is the first segment really of this video. I heard some clips, saw some things, and I knew I wanted to do a video on this because I grew up with fundamentalism and being a fundamentalist being a good thing, and that has shifted. So the first clip I want to share with you guys is from Rick Warren. This clip comes from June 2023. He was doing a response video after the Southern Baptist churches voted at the National Convention to disfellowship from Rick Warren's church, Saddleback Church, 
um, for ordaining three women pastors in May of 2021. If you want more on this story, I did a video on my channel. I'll link it in the description if you want my reflections on that actual event. But why I'm playing this clip is as a part of that press conference slash video briefing he did after the SBC vote announced the results, is he talked about fundamentalism and what it meant to be a fundamentalist and how it has changed. And so let's watch this clip together. This is one of the first times I really noticed this had changed and become something different than I grew up with. A fundamentalist, the word, the meaning has changed. Fundamentalist, a hundred years ago, we, I would have called myself a fundamentalist because it means you hold to the fundamental doctrines of historic Orthodox Christianity. Today, a fundamentalist is an attitude. There are Muslim fundamentalists, there are Buddhist fundamentalists, atheist fundamentalists, secular fundamentalists, communist fundamentalists, Christian right fundamentalists. It, it, fundamentalist is somebody who stopped listening. That's the fundamental thing. They've stopped listening. There are quite a few things in that video I could talk about and we're going to talk about over the course of this video, but to hear him say the fundamental thing is that they've stopped listening, that they've closed their ears was like like that is not the fundamentalism i grew up with and he even mentioned there that it has changed and so i was thinking about that been marinating on that for about a year now and then i ran across this clip from gavin ortland that i want to share with you guys from his channel truth unites he does some great videos and he promoted a j.i packer book in the middle of one of his videos and he talked about how there are these extremes in this world of chaos. And he talked about how there's liberals or people who want to modernize Christianity or deconvert on one side. And the other extreme is fundamentalism. And that caught me off guard a little bit. So let's watch this video from him as well. I'm always trying to commend good resources. And I love J.I. Packer. You know, here's one of the problems in the world right now is in the midst of all the chaos, there's uh, an increase in extremes. So you get a lot of people becoming more fundamentalist and then you get a lot of people deconstructing altogether or going way liberal and like healthy centrist evangelical voices like Packer who rock solid on scripture, but also a little more ecumenical, just a good theologian. So there you have the two extremes talked about and it was really shocking to me to hear that fundamentalism was one of those extremes. I was like, doesn't fundamentalism mean held beliefs like core doctrine, orthodox Christianity things? Why is this seen as an attitude, closing our ears, Rick Warren's video or Ortland's thing seen as an extreme? And yes, I totally agree that Packer is a great evangelical centrist voice, but what did Ortland mean by that? And so it launched me into the content that we're going to cover in this video, diving into this topic and talk about how the use of fundamentalist fundamentalism has changed over the past 100 years because it's obviously not what I grew up with and it being a good thing. And I want to put this in video form and just share it with you guys and get your help along the way with any insights, articles, videos, books, things you can talk to me about. So even as I'm going through this video, if you're thinking of something, put it in the comments. I would love to learn about this topic with you guys. So Next, let's get into defining our terms because I think that's going to be important as we go through the rest of this video, which is going to be long at different points, but I wanted to dump all of these thoughts and just share what I've been thinking about and studying because I think it's important for us to know this history and know how these terms are being used. So first, the fundamentals, the word fundamentalist or funda, uh, fundamentalism or the ism associated with it has its roots in the fundamentals which come from the fundamental essays that were published between 1910 and 1915. We're going to cover this more in the historic section, but here's brief. is from those essays, five key points of doctrine are identified. The inerrancy of the Bible, the divinity of Christ, the virgin birth of Christ, Christ's physical resurrection, and the literal truth of Jesus's miracles. You can hear them listed out in the DeYoung video that I have referenced there, and we'll hear some clips from that very soon. You also can get a pretty good listing of those fundamental doctrines and what's being talked about from the table of content in Jay Gresham Machen's book, 
Christianity and liberalism. Machen it does not claim to be a fundamentalist, actually rejected the label, but as a Presbyterian who was holding to some fundamental doctrines as the Presbyterian church was going through the modernist controversy, the table of contents in this book is really worth going through and looking and seeing some of those fundamentals as well. We'll cover the table of contents a little later in this video. When we're talking about a fundamentalist in this video, we're really gonna talk about how that's a label given to a person, used of a person, and that's really changed its definition from the 1920s to now being 2024-ish era. Um, in the 20s, 1920s, it was a person or group who held to certain doctrines they believed to be fundamental to historic Orthodox Christianity. Pastor Warren covered that in his video already. That's what it meant historically in the 1920s. But now we're going to cover in this video how it's really become and shifted to how one holds their beliefs. As Ortland said in his video and has said in other ones, it's people who clamp down. So you have the two extremes, people who clamp down too much on their theology or and the, their convictions or the past or they're too conservative. And then you have this other side where they're too loose and they either deconstruct or they become liberals. And we centrist in the middle is what he pushed for. And so that's what it's kind of become now is it's become how one holds their beliefs as being too tightly and clamped down. It's also a term that historically has always been thrown around and used of others. Lots of people do not actually own the term. It's used for people outside who say they are more they are less conservative, less clamped down, or less uh, tight than others. And so it's usually a label that's slapped around and used of others, and few actually own the label itself. Um, fundamentalism is the ism that comes from that types of holding those beliefs. But historically, it's an interdenominational movement within evangelical Protestantism that dissented from the progressive theology within the mainline churches that was occurring during the 1900s. Um, modernist or modernism, when we use it in this video, we're talking about people who seek to modernize Christianity, to liberate it, to give people more freedom than that which was in the past or has historically been done. Um, also, separatist is going to come up here. It's people who want to separate just because they differ in one or different points of doctrine. They feel they need to separate instead of being together even with some differences. They either need to separate in churches, ecclesiology, or in culture from the culture itself. Uh, we also talk about conservatives and liberals is going to come up multiple times in this video. We're not talking political when we use those terms. So we're really talking about conservative as people who want to look at the past and they say there are things that need to can be conserved, be preserved, and be passed on to the current generations that are good and we should conserve preserve and send those things forward and continue in those things and conserve the past liberals really comes from this idea that they want to liberate from the past and give people more freedom and so we see that term used a lot especially in the historical era we're going to talk about and it's also worth noting here that the liberals who had infiltrated the church at the time really loved to operate in low visibility, which is how they got into the institutions, into seminaries, into churches for a long time before these issues came to a head. And by low visibility, I mean they used the same terminology as historic Orthodox Christianity, but they would define the terms differently. And when pressed for the actual beliefs they held, you would start to see, they would start to deny the inerrancy of scripture, um, the actual miracles of Jesus, the actual virgin birth, those sorts of things, even though on the surface they would use the same language, the same terms as Christians have used for many ages. Also, the term evangelical is going to come up. This term really first arises in the 1800s as people from the Reformation and the Puritans started to die out and people became more just going through the motions and belonging to a church or a parish. There were people who defined themselves like we are people of the gospel who have been made new, who have been born again, um, people of the evangelical of the gospel. And that's when the term first comes up. And then it was revived during the Billy Graham era, which we'll cover a bit in this video, um, as a unifying term that you had moderates, moderate, you know, liberals on one side and fundamentalists on the other. And Billy Graham comes in and really uses evangelical as a centrist 
middle ground to unify people and we'll talk through that in this video if you want more on that term evangelical in the political side of things i would encourage you to get thomas kidd's book who is an evangelical really great treatment on who an evangelical is and deals with some of those political things and such there as well historical literary a good book to catch up on or pick up if you want more on this term in that regard, what it's meant historically and throughout literature and it's been used, uh, The Evangelical Imagination by Karen Swallow Pryor. I have a review up on my channel of that work. She has some good chapters in there about that. The whole book's not about that, but some good chapters on the term evangelicalism and evangelical and what that means. Evangelicalism is just the ism attached to evangelical. And then I wanna play this clip for you guys. As we finish this, finish this term portion, we talk about the conservatives versus the moderates, the liberals, um, the progressives, all of those types of things, those concepts, um, they're all very lumped together terms and very closely related. And so I wanna play this clip by Dr. Al Mohler from Southern Seminary. Um, as a Southern Baptist, I listen to his stuff a lot. And he did this really good interview with Westminster Seminary for a podcast um, on Machen's book, Christianity and Liberalism. And he talks about how they have combated some of these ideas in the past. And he uses some of these terms and talks about um, that these dangers still exist in the church today, just under different labels. And so I want to play this clip for us. The liberalism or modernism that uh, that Machen was addressing, those were words. And by the way, many of those words were were used by the people themselves who were the proponents. They really were calling for Christianity to be entirely adjusted to this modern reality. They were really seeking to liberate Christianity from this incrustation of doctrine. Think of you know Adolf von Harnack and others. We got this is the modern age. You got to get rid of this procrustean bed of doctrine. And, you know, th that's just fast forwarded to where we are now. That's that's the logic of progressivism. And and so, yeah, you see this right now. You see that the same the same thing is going on. I'm simply going to say it goes by a lot of names, liberalism, modernism, progressivism, identity politics. You just go down the list. Wokeism. And, you know, that's increasingly used by the right to describe the left. But the left invented the word woke. But nonetheless, the whole idea is enlightenment. That's just a, you know, a a a. a uh, an urban slang for uh, enlightenment, woke, awakened. The idea is that conservatives are in the dark, liberals are in the light, and uh, so the dynamic is exactly the same. So there you have it, the enlightenment type of concept talked about. As we go throughout the rest of this video, I'll use some of those terms, progressive, moderate, or, you know, modern um, or liberals interchangeably. And we're really talking about this idea that historic Orthodox Christianity, the conservatives are in the dark, and then it needs to be liberated, it needs to be modernized, we need to progress forward, um, we need to be awakened to a new reality. And the church has fought this battle and continues to fight this battle. And so I thought that was really a good clip from Dr. Moeller just to kind of set as we go through all these terms, what is the church battling against and what are we trying to hold on to held beliefs and to defend the faith so next segment of this video historically held beliefs what has fundamentalism or fundamentalist meant historically 1920s era a hundred years ago from when I'm filming this video. The fundamentalism essays, we're gonna go talk through those, as well as the Northern denominations as an example. I'm also gonna talk about J. Gresham Machen, and then also mention the Scopes trial briefly in this historical segment. So we already saw in the Rick Warren clip that I played towards the beginning of this video from June 23 is that a hundred years ago, he would have called himself a fundamentalist. He said, because it meant something different. It meant someone who held to the historic Orthodox Christian beliefs. And so we see that arise from the fundamentalism essays or the fundamentals essays and the key points of doctrine. And so I have this clip up that I'm going to play from Kevin DeYoung, who did his Life Books and Everything interview with two authors who wrote the Oxford Handbook 
of Christian fundamentalism. And they talk about these five key areas of doctrine that arose from these fundamental essays and where this movement kind of got its name and its initial start and what it meant. So let's watch this clip together. You say on, uh, in your opening chapter, this is page five, the Christian Protestant fundamentalism that is the focus of this handbook can be traced back to the publication of 12 volumes of essays between 1910 and 1915 gathered together under the title The Fundamentals, written by a wide cross-section of evangelicals bankrolled by Californian oil tycoon Lyman Stewart. The Fundamentals covered a broad range of themes, theological, devotional, practical, although not all took the strictly conservative line. And then you say five key points of doctrine were identified uh, as under particular assault by the liberal and modernistic theology of the day. So one, the inerrancy of the Bible, two, the divinity of Christ, three, his virgin birth, four, his physical resurrection, and five, the literal truth of Jesus' miracles. So there you have it, the five that kind of arise out of those fundamentalism or fundamental essays published between 1910 and 1915. I have them up there on the screen for you just as a reminder, the inerrancy of the Bible, the divinity of Christ, a point on that. Dr. Moeller in the interview that I already shared part of talks about how one of his first classes at Southern Seminary, um, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary as a student, uh, liberalism had crept into the seminary so much to the f fact that the, one of the first professors he had didn't even believe in the Trinity. They would say they believed in the Trinity, but they really denied the divinity of Christ, and it wasn't the Trinity that Orthodox um, historical Christianity believed in. And so that's the types of things that were going on during this era and that were being identified. Um, three, you have the virgin birth of Christ, also Christ's physical resurrection was being denied, and then the literal truth of Jesus's miracles. It's made note of later in the De Young video. I didn't play these clips, but later on, some groups have added to the fundamentals, to those five key doctrinal points, some other issues. Um, so they take the joke in the video. So how fundamental are they if they've been added later? But I want to include that you may see in this list, some people include creationism and a rejection of evolution in a fundamentals list. Also, dispensational premillennialism gets added by some groups and tribes as well. And you could find others, obviously. So why were these essays needed? So these essays come out, why were they needed? So they were really needed because of the modernist theology slash the liberal theology that had been creeping into the states since the 1800s from Europe, most notably uh, Germany and the high criticism that was happening there, but also just in many sorts that was coming from is or Europe into the United States at the time. Also, at the same time, it's, it's the world was changing massively at that time. You had the Age of Enlightenment was going on. We were entering a new age. The old was dark. We were coming into the light was a big push of the time. Modernity is happening, the modern age. There's changes in the um, discipline of science and how science is being talked about. There's uh, differences in the area of knowledge and what we can know and not know. And also the nature of truth was being changed. And all these changes were happening around the same time. And so in the 1920s, it came to a head. So this modernist, fundamentalist, different beliefs around Christianity thing came to a head in the U.S in multiple denominations between the two world wars. And I have the dates up there for you. And it became known as the modernist or the fundamentalist and modernist controversy. And so you have right there between the two world wars, a lot of these things and discussions are happening in Christian denominations in the United States. And so for example, I'm going to talk about the northern denominations both Baptist and Presbyterians, as an example for some of the things historically that were going on during this time. So one of the big things that happened to drop a, kind of a marker for us is Harry Emerson Fosdick preached a sermon called Will the Fundamentalist or Shall the Fundamentalist Win? And so Kevin DeYoung has a great article on this sermon, but he preached this sermon. So Fosdick is a Baptist and he preached it at a Presbyterian church on May 21st, 1922. And so he was a professor at Union Theological Seminary. He's doing pulpit filling for a, a Presbyterian church. 
and Manhattan to deliver this sermon. And this sermon that he gave in 1922 did not cause the division, um, but it cast a strong light on the division that was already there. And so both Baptist denominations in the North or the denomination in the North and the Presbyterians had to deal with this issue because of the visibility of Fosdick. He's one of the most um, popular preachers of his time. And so they had to deal with this. But it's been boiling for a while. It had been boiling in the Presbyterian world since the death of B.B. Warfield in 1921. Um, and so Princeton Theological Seminary was going through a turnover, going through change. And so it would affect that denomination of the Presbyterians as a whole. And so J. Gresham Machen really steps forward in this time as a Presbyterian. And so he wrote his book, Christianity and Liberalism, about this time. I believe it was based on lectures he gave first and then developed in a book and talked about the things they believed as fundamentals. He said, because he said Christianity and liberalism were two very different re religions or things. You had people like Fosdick who were saying, hey, we're, um, we don't believe in the miracles of Jesus. We don't believe in the virgin birth of Jesus, but we're still Christian. And Machen within the Presbyterian camp said, no, Christianity and liberalism, the and is the most important part of the title. He said, it's not Christian liberalism. It's something completely new. It's something completely different historically in this time. And they could not be combined because that would break a new thing and, it's, <laughs> and it would be no longer Christian. And so for Machen, there existed no such thing as liberal Christianity for it denied the central doctrines of Orthodox Christianity. It is important to note here that Machen did not consider himself a fundamentalist, but he was happy at this time to have allies defending the basic tenets of the Christian faith. And so the table of contents for his book, which I have right here, which is an excellent edition from Westminster Seminary Press. It's the 100th anniversary one that I hope to read later this year. He goes through the introduction, but then he gets into doctrine and why that matters. Um, the doctrine of God and man, so the theology proper and anthropology, what we believe about mankind. He gets into the Bible, the inerrancy of scripture, and also Christ, and then salvation, and also the church, and how fundamental and how core those things are to Christianity, and what we confess about those things. At the same time, that's going on with Machen. He ends up starting his own denomination, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, his own school, Westminster Theological Seminary, his own mission board. We'll cover that in a later video, hopefully in the historical section in the fall. But at the same time that they're dealing with that in the Presbyterian camp and, and causing just things of discussions about this modernist fundamentalist thing, the Northern Baptists were doing very similar things, but they really struggled to make some decisions. So from 1923 to 1933, so it was just a full 10 years, the Northern Baptist fundamentalists disagreed on the best strategy to counter the progressive trends in the Northern Baptist Convention. And so they started some seminaries, some schools, some unions and mission boards during that time. Um, some separatist fundamentalists from the Northern Baptist Convention left the church and started their own different types of churches. I believe that's where my church probably came from. Very similar to people who thought that way. Um, started the Bible church movement in different, different ways, shapes and forms. Um, that I grew up in, but some formed other Baptist groups. Noted, so the GARB was formed, the General Association of Regular Baptist Churches in 1932. And so that's some of the history involved in that section. I could talk way more about it, but there's the brief overview of some of that. The Northern Baptist Convention actually fully dissolved over this controversy because they, they didn't weren't able to counter the progressive move of theology within the denomination. Another thing to mention in the historic section, um, because it's important, is the Scopes Trial of 1925, known as the Scopes Monkey Trial. So the trial was against John Thomas Scopes for teaching evolution in a Tennessee classroom. And so this really was the first big public thing it played out on a public national stage uh, of the fundamentalist modernist controversy, not within denominations, not within a school, but in the papers, everyone was reading about this. And it really set the modernists who said evolution could be consistent with religion 
against the fundamentalists who said the word of God as revealed in the Bible took priority over all human knowledge. And so the case was thus seen both as a theological contest and a trial on whether evolution should or could be taught in schools. And so the fundamentalist groups ultimately won the trial. You can go read about this. It's quite the read. It's really interesting stuff. But the fundamentalists actually won the trial, but the trial revealed a growing chasm in America at the time between Christianity and the two ways of finding truth within Christianity at a time as it was perceived. So one biblical and one evolutionist. And so you have a way of finding truth that's biblical, and then you have it pitted against a way of finding truth through evolution, through science, through reason, and you see that growing chasm during this trial. And so way more about that could be said. Go find more online for those who want to read up on it. So the next segment of this video is the shift and shifting definition. So I talked about what historically fundamentalism and fundamentalist is, where it came from, gave some brief examples, could do way more, but moving into the shift that I've noticed and shifting definition. So we'll talk through some things from Billy Graham, John Stott, and the evangelical overlap. So first up, Billy Graham, his first crusade was in 1947. That's just two years after the end of World War II. So it's important to think about what's going on in the world stage as we get to some of these things that are happening theologically within churches. And so Billy Graham used the evangelical label as a label to unify people. And so we really see what Gavin Ortland was talking about at the beginning of this video starting to form right here as evangelical is seen as the centrist middle. And then you have the extremes of fundamentalism on one side and moderns or liberals on the other. And so as evangelicalism grew, it really started distancing itself from fundamentalism in the 1940s and 50s. Graham was a big part of that. And you see evangelical figures starting to distance themselves from fundamentalists and fundamentalism as a whole. And so one of those figures that tried to distance themselves from that was John Stott, who was an English Anglican priest and theologian. And he was a notable leader of the worldwide evangelical movement at the time. So I've already talked about Graham, who used the term even, or evangelical, and Stott as well as, is an evangelical. And so I have this clip here from DeYoung again from this interview that I've already mentioned and he's going to talk about how Stott wished to repudiate some things and distance himself as an evangelical from fundamentalism. And so we're going to get into how he was trying to do that in this video. You talk about how Stott in a uh, you know, sort of typical, shall we say, third way, wanted to, okay, we, liberals, fundamentalists, evangelicals. So the evangelicals are are the good guys in the middle. So on page 11 in your opening chapter, you talk about some of these uh, eight identifying characteristics which Stott wished to repudiate. A suspicion of scholarship, a mechanical view of dictation theory, a superstitious reverence for the King James, literalistic interpretation, separatist ecclesiology, cultural imprisonment, a denial of the social implications of the gospel, premillennial eschatology. So, uh, yeah, that that resonates with how I think many people understand the difference between fundamentalism and evangelical. You said earlier, you know, Marsden's was, a fundamentalist is an evangelical who's angry about something. And I think you give the, the other kind of quip in the other direction, you know, an evangelical is a fundamentalist with good manners. Really love that clip and wanted to share it with you guys. So notable things from the clip is first, Dion goes on to share that um, these are not so much this list from Stott are not, is not so much a definition of fundamentalism, but these are things Stott is saying his movement, uh, evangelicalism, is not like. And so he's trying to differentiate himself from this movement, but there's lots of overlap here, which you saw him talking about. And so I already talked about the, I'm putting the list up there for you guys so you can see it again and pause if you want to know more. He talks about a suspicion of scholarship. So, so obviously Stott is saying his movement is not like these things, but fundamentalism is. So a mechanical view of dictation theory, a superstitious reverence for the King James, literal 
pluralistic interpretation of the Bible. If you want more on that, I've done a video on my channel on biblicism of being too literal and some of the dangers of going that route. Check out that video if you want to know more. He talks about separatist ecclesiology, just dividing our churches over the smallest differences instead of staying together, cultural imprisonment, um, denial of the social implications of the gospel, and premillennial eschatology makes his list. As So Stott, as a British evangelical, is saying, um, my movement is not like fundamentalism in these areas, which is worth noting, not because he's defining fundamentalism, but he's saying we're not like that. I also really enjoyed that they went on to give the quip from Marsden really that started it that there's lots of overlap between evangelicals and fundamentalists. So he says a fundamentalist is an evangelical who is angry about something. Notice that even at this shifting time from Stott and Marsden as a historian is seeing that really if you're uh, an e evangelical who's angry, you're a fundamentalist. But it can be equally said that an evangelical is a fundamentalist with good manners. So if you're a fundamentalist with good manners, then you're an evangelical. And so we see that like, <laughs> the term can be applied to each person depending on how you're comporting yourself or behaving around your beliefs. If you're angry, fundamentalist. If you're a fundamentalist who's well-mannered, if you're well-mannered, you're evangelical, which is just interesting to think about how closely related they are even during these shifting times and even during today. So that sets up our transition to current how one holds their beliefs is really what fundamentalism has come to mean today. Some, someone who's a fundamentalist holds their beliefs tightly, they clamp down. We're going to talk through examples in this section from Pope Francis Dan White quote from Twitter slash X, Tim, and Tim Keller, six social marks of fundamentalism. I'm also going to bring up an Alistair Begg clip as well. So first, no, this is no longer a Christian thing. So fundamentalism is no longer a Christian thing. Pope Francis mentioned in 2019 that we must be aware of fundamentalist groups. Each religion has their own. So it historically started kind of as a Christian thing, to my knowledge and my research, and now it's in all religions, according to the Pope. He says, he went on to say, fundamentalism is a plague and all religions have some fundamentalist first cousin, which is very interesting. Um, I already played the clip from Gavin Ortland where he talks about clamping down. It's people who hold their beliefs too tightly, too conservative. They go to an extreme and we already use some terms that people use for it. And we'll do more in the video to talk about bad terms and bad things that people do by doing that. Um, I also pull up Rick Warren. We already talked about the first clip. He talks about the shift, it really is an attitude. He said fundamentalism is someone who stopped listening. And he talked about there are Muslim fundamentalists, there are Buddhist fundamentalists, there are secular communists. It's really someone who stopped listening and clamped down on their held beliefs. Um, also, Warren, in a famous Pew Research interview, I wanted to pull up these quotes that he predicted that fundamentalism of all varieties will be one of the big enemies of the 21st century. And he actually made that prediction in 2005. I have the link there for you guys if you want to check it out. He says, now the word fundamentalist actually comes from a document in the 1920s. And he talks about that. And it's a very legalistic, narrow view of Christianity, which is just an interesting thing to say. And so we're just seeing here how people have said that it's in all religions. It's people who clamp down too hard or too conservative in their beliefs. And really, because of that, fundamentalism or fundamentalist, when it's used of someone, it's, a, it's an attitude or an action. It's no longer about theological held beliefs. And here's the Dan White quote from Twitter. DeYoung mentions this in his video, which brought it to my attention. And this quote says, fundamentalism is not what we believe. That's what I grew up with. But he's saying it's no longer what we believe. It's how we hold our beliefs. So that's how it's perceived now. That's how it's used now. And then he goes through a list. And this list is nothing you want to reflect your held beliefs. He talks about absolutism in knowledge, self-righteousness in spirit, combative in dialogue, us versus them in orientation, 
demonizing other groups, policing ideological borders, using shame to ostracize. That is not the type of fundamentalism I want to be associated with, even though I historically believe it was a good thing. And so that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this video to talk about this is how people see it today. This is how people use it today. And I'm like, wow, that's like quite the change there. Um, to continue the Stott stream, I want to play this clip by Alistair Begg. This clip from, comes from a sermon he gave earlier in 2024. He's the senior pastor of Cleveland Parkside Church. He's been there for over 40 years. You might know him from Truth For Life. He got um, kind of caught up in a controversy over um, advice that he gave. He calls it the storm in a teacup to a grandmother about tending, attending her gay granddaughter's wedding and even bringing a gift. And so that's advice he's not given before to anyone else in his lifetime. It was a, kind of a one-time thing and he's not even sure what he's going to do in the future. But it caused this firestorm and he reviews his roots and talks about giving this advice with nuance. He talks about how he he came from British evangelicalism and not American fundamentalism. And so I wanted you guys to hear how he talks about it because I think it bears on how people use these terms today in a real world situation just from a couple months ago. Now, let me say something that would be a little explosive. <laughs> I've lived here for 40 years and those who know me best know that when we talk theology, when we talk stuff, I, I've always said I am a little bit out of sync with the American evangelical world for this reason, that I am the product of British evangelicalism represented by John Stott, Martin Lloyd-Jones, Eric Alexander, Sinclair Ferguson, Derek Prime. I am a product of that. I have never been a product of American fundamentalism. I come from a world in which it is possible for people to actually grasp the fact that there are nuances in things. Those of you who are lawyers understand this. Everything is not so categorically clear that if you put one foot out of this box, you got to be removed from the box forever. So there you have the clip. I think it's interesting. He gets to the end. He talks about if you put one foot outside the box, you take one step outside of their camp, the advice they would give, you're out of it forever, which really pulls back to Dan White's thing about absolutism and knowledge and policing ideological borders. But I just saw that clip and I was like... <laughs> There's no reference to held beliefs. Historically, what fundamentalism has meant at all in that clip, it's all about the attitude and action of clamping down and holding too tightly to beliefs. If you want to know more about this situation with Beg and my thoughts on it and what really grieved my heart of the situation, I did a video on my channel that I'll link to in the description as well. But just wanted us to key in a real... Um, life example just a couple months ago of how the term has shifted and even its use. It's seen as this box, you step one foot out of it and they separate and they kick you out and they cancel you for it. And he talks about how his British evangelicalism is different, which we've already talked about with Stott as well. I also want to cover in this section briefly, just Tim Keller, this is the last thing before the next section. Um, wrote these uh, series of articles before his death on um, reviving uh, evangelicalism in America. And it further shows how evangelicalism has distanced itself and distinguished itself from fundamentalism. And so he talks in these articles, he goes through a section where he talks about the six social marks of fundamentalism versus evangelicalism. So obviously the bad example on the front end is fundamentalism. And then the good example Tim Keller is giving is evangelicalism's pr presentation and embrace of that as it comes to social engagement. So this is mentioned in the DeYoung video. So I have the timestamp for where it's mentioned in there. And you can also get the article and go read it yourself. Feel free to pause my notes as I'm reading this if you want to read what he means by each one. But here's the list. He talks about moralism versus gracious engagement. So you have fundamentalism is moralism and then evangelicalism and it's social 
uh, Mark is more gracious in its engagement. So bad goods, and that's for the whole list. So he talks about individualism versus social reform, dualism versus a vision for all of life, anti-intellectualism versus scholarship, uh, anti-institutionalism versus accountability, and then enculturation versus cultural reflection. And so if you look at that list, you take Dan White's list, you took what Beg said, I'm like, fundamentalism has changed drastically from what I thought it was or what it was historically at the beginning. And I believed for most of my life was a good thing. And so this is not the type of fundamentalism I would endorse at all. And so, or want to be involved with. And so I'm even thinking through these things like we're talking fundamentalism, like Warren, I'm talking like held beliefs. I'm with you and I want to hold to those beliefs. And I'm like, this attitude or action thing, I'm like, wow, like this, this is how we're describing people and labeling people who are conservative. And um, just wanted to dive in and say, like, this is what it means now. It's to a lot of people. And we should know that as we use these terms, as we think about these things. So that leads into my applications and summary points. Um, really, we see fundamentalism and fundamentalist is a label that's applied to people who are more conservative than you and you think you are the good guys. So few people hold the label, but everyone uses it. But what are we to make of this shift that we've just covered in 100 years? So a few summary points uh, that just were floating around my mind as I was reading these things and wanted to share with you guys is first that we've seen this shift to an attitude or action. That fundamentalism is for most people now way more of an attitudinal thing or an actional thing uh, than a theological thing. So it's far less about beliefs and way more about how you hold those beliefs. And so DeYoung makes that observation in his video and I think he's dead on. We also see that it's a label consistently thrown around and used of others. There are very few people who actually own the label. And so someone will always be more conservative than you. So DeYoung makes that observation. I believe it's totally true. And that is often when this label gets used to paint other people slash yourself and your tribe as the good guys and to paint other people as the bad guys. Um, it's also for those who do own the title, and there are some people who do own the title, they usually classify types of fundamentalism. And so they would say, um, the fundamentalism when you're holding to core doctrines is the good type of fundamentalism. And then they would say hyper fundamentalism is the bad kind. And so it's used in that way as well. Also, fundamentalists, when examined, uh, often fade into the mist. I like this observation in the DeYoung interview. They talked about that when you examine someone you believe to be a fundamentalist, you uh, find often nuance as you drill deeper into their story, into their history, into their church, into their beliefs, and you discover that you are studying another evangelical. He's saying that someone may comport themselves, present themselves in a certain way or in a certain controversy and battle, and you're like, that's fundamentalist. And then as you dig into that person and their ministry and their history, you find out this is really just another evangelical, which is interesting to think about. Lastly, fundamentalism and fundamentalists will continue to be a flash term used for deconversion stories, people who have left Christianity, bad situations of authoritarianism, people who are overly strict. Um, but there are still real um, situations out there that hurt people. So these conditions, these things do apply. They are, um, they do exist. And so these people who may be hurt by these things are probably still in our churches. And so I really enjoyed in the DeYoung video, they talked towards the end just about the fact that um, in our age of therapeutic, you know, deism and everyone wants to feel good. Some people feel hurt by just historic Orthodox Christianity and it's overreaction by themselves. And they talked about their deconversion story and it's a buzzword and it sells lots of books. But there are people who have been in strict sex and different areas of the church and authoritarian systems that do need healing, do need the grace of Jesus Christ, do need to be told what the Bible clearly says and what it doesn't say. And so DeYoung talks in his video, and I totally agree, 
that we have to enter into the lives of our people in our churches, situation by situation, listening to them, understanding where they came from, and loving on them in the name of Jesus Christ and pointing them towards healthy doctrine and um, good doctrine and things to believe. And so we just can't write them off and say they're overreacting. Uh, we should love them where they are in our churches. So with that, resources used for this video, there's a list. I'll also um, link, to, I'm gonna do a blog post with abbreviated notes that I've been sharing during this video. Um, everything's timestamped, linked, and the all the resources I used for this video on the blog post if you wanna go check any of them out in longer form than I was able to share with you guys here. Last feedback, I would love your insights on this topic, articles, book recommendations. I wanna dive more into this topic. I really just really enjoyed studying this and how historically it's changed and running into these clips. And I'd love to learn more. If you have articles, clips, books, things I should read, I would love to learn with you guys. And so last, I plan to do a future video on the history segment, that 1920s era, specifically with the Presbyterians and Westminster Theological Seminary, once I read this book, Christianity and Liberalism, later this year. So with that, back to the word, like, subscribe. If you made it to the end of this video, would love to hear about that even in the comments. Until next time, continue to read, treasure, follow the word. God bless, and I'll see you guys soon.